Uh, Raphael works for WWF Bolivia, coordinating the Pantanal uh, Chaco Landscape and leading Wildlife Connect, a partnership that, that aims to protect, manage, and restore the ecological connectivity of landscapes, enabling large scale wildlife movement and linking wildlife and people. We've invited Raphael here to share his ex expertise as a conservationist responsible for coordinating movement data, sharing across a wide range of stakeholders in diverse landscapes. We thought his, his perspective and experience would be a really interesting um, uh, view to bring into the discussion. So we're delighted you've joined us. Raphael, do you want to take it away? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. As you said, I am Rafael Antelo. I'm a Spanish biologist. I've been working and living in South America for the last 20 years, and now I'm leading this uh, interesting, uh, amazing to me, uh, initiative. It's called Wildlife Connect. It's a joint initiative between WWF, the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group of the IUCN, and the CLC, the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, based in Bozeman, Montana. And uh, I'm going to explain you a very particular situation we we're passing through right now. Uh, because we work in large landscapes in which um, we cannot work uh, alone, as our vision says in WWF, together possible. We need to have the collaboration of some other stakeholders, in this case, uh, scientists. And uh, what we are passing through a very interesting situation, I think, that I want to share with, with you. But for giving you a little bit of context, uh, as you know, this initiative is about uh, uh, ecological connectivity, the wildlife movements, the, the flow of ecological processes in these in this large and iconic large uh, landscapes, like this picture here of the build the best uh, migration between the Masai Mara and the Serengeti, Kenya and, and Tanzania. And as you know, ecological connectivity is very important to maintain the, the, the ecosystem healthy and the, the wildlife thriving, but we have two major, we have a lot, but two major threats uh, for connectivity, which is linear, linear infrastructure, roads, railways, uh, pipelines, gas lines, fences, and land use chains, like in many other situations. What we want to get at the end is this, is this uh, what we call the ecological network. It's when you have the protected areas connected through um, ecological corridors, like these narrow, dark green polygons, or through new protected areas, like the one here in the north of Bhutan. This is a real example. Uh, this country in just eight years connected the whole uh, protected areas, losing very few protection. But, well, this is the, the example we all like, but what we usually find is this. You now the, the, the protected areas, the core areas isolated into the Macy matrix. For example, here in South America, just 30% of the protected areas are effectively connected. And we have everything in the landscape. We have roads, we have uh, villages, we have fences, we have crops, we have cattle ranchers. So we have uh, developed this theory of change to address this situation. And I'm going to be focusing the first step here in science, because the first thing we have to do is to map the ecological network. Now, it's when you have to, uh, to identify where are the protected areas or the core areas, which is something quite easy but uh, not so easy to identify where are the corridors connecting these protected areas that are being used by the, by the wildlife. There are many ways to do it. You can use a, a functional connectivity, a structural connectivity. And uh, once you have that, you, you have to do some advocacy to include this connectivity, these ecological corridors into the spatial planning and governance. And you can find three main situations when you have to protect. The corridors, which is not the most common, unfortunately, manage, which is the most common situation, manage for wildlife permeability, or to restore, which is the most common, for example, in Europe or United States, when you have to build these eco ducts or uh, overpasses or underpasses. So um, we have four demonstrative landscapes. Uh, as I said, they are the big ones, one in each continent. And the ones I'm going to be focused is the one here in South America, we call Pacha, because it includes the Pantanal and the Chaco landscape. And talking about connectivity, you can use many species, focal species, but we, are, we selected the, the jaguar for several reasons. It's an umbrella species. Uh, in theory, if you secure a jaguar connectivity, you are securing also the connectivity of other species. And also because this study developed by Pantera around 10, 12 years ago, they identified that the corridors of concern of the species, which in theory we have a continuous distribution from Mexico to Argentina, um, 
most of the corridors of concern were here in, in Pacha, which is a transboundary landscape, is served by Bolivia, uh, Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina. We have the world's largest tropical wetland, uh, the Pantanal, and also the largest tropical dry forest, the Chaco. And two main threats, of course, we have a lot. Uh, but deforestation, we, we uh, have one of the main deforestation fronts in the world here in the Chaco because of the soy and beef um, industries. And the climate change in Pantanal, we have lost 30% of the surface water in the last 30 years. So this is a big problem. But we also have strong indigenous territories and indigenous, uh, unprotected areas, especially here in Bolivia. And we also still remain and the uncontacted Yoruba people in the border between Bolivia and uh, Paraguay, it is the only one outside of the, of the Amazon. So we are also involved in a, involved in a bigger strategy, the, the, JAG, the WWF Jaguar strategy, in which they have prioritized 15 landscapes, and three of them are here in, in, in Pacha. It is the Pantanal, the Chaco, and El Impenetrable. As I said, we have some large number of corridors of concern, and we have evidence that we have lost connectivity between uh, this Jaguar Conservation Unit here is called uh, the uh, Atlantic Forest and the Impenetrable. We have genetic data that we have lost that. So we started to look for uh, connectivity approaches in the region. We found several, some of them, all of them were different, with different focus. Uh, the Argentina one was focused on the Jaguar and they get this, this result, this, this corridors. Then the Bolivia one was focused on humid areas, which to me is very new and very interesting. The humid corridors. For, uh, we have another exercise done by uh, Embrapa, Brazil, and they identify a large number of corridors, mainly based on the structural connectivity for the three, for a section of the three countries, Brazil, Bolivia, and Paraguay, in the upper river basin. So when we were talking with the science team, they say, well, we cannot use this. We need a comprehensive model for Pacha, for the Jaguar. And this is when we decided that we need to create uh, the, the, the ecological network for, for Pacha. And we decided to invite a group of uh, experts on Jaguar and or uh, connectivity to a workshop to identify, to form first the, this connectivity group in Pacha to share information about the Jaguar. Because as I said, it's one million square kilometers and we have some information, good information in some areas, but some other areas are deserts in terms of information. So we have to build a model and we need to have as much information as we can. And uh, the expected product of this workshop is this map uh, representing the vision of the ecological connectivity in Pacha. So with the focal, uh, uh, with the, uh, focal points of each country, we invited this expert. Most of them are um, partners of WWF in, in, the, in the countries. Uh, we prepare a very detailed agenda. We work a lot in the, in the workshop, sorry, it's in, it's in Spanish. But uh, once we were there, uh, and we, sh we, asked, we start to ask them or to explain them we were, what we wanted to do, um, that we need their expertise and their data. We were very clear that we were, we were only expecting published data, but for some reason, they understand also the unpublished data. So they have two main claims. They, they, they they don't think that we need a, a comprehensive model for the whole patch, and they were claiming about data sharing. Say no, this is unpublished data. This is new research. We cannot we cannot share with you. This is a PhD thesis, a master thesis, whatever. So they smashed our agenda just in one hour and a half. It was a two days uh, workshop. We have to be, to do a great adaptive management to re rebuild the, the agenda just in ten minutes. We give them uh, the opportunity to talk, all of them, what they, what they did, what they are doing, what they, what they were expecting. And at the end, the good thing is that they understood that it was important to build this comprehensive model, although they are doing a great job in, their, in the regions, in their, their territories. But we need this comprehensive model for some reason, for many reasons, not for science, for to do some fundraising. And after two days of discussing, we get to the start point. And they agreed to collaborate and share their knowledge with us. So we built this um, table with them, where, when, which we select which variables are important for Jaguar movements in the, in the territory. And we asked them to give us a value, a resistant value, sorry, it's in Spanish again, a, a resistant value depending on the variable of the landscape, of course, variables that can be, uh, can be put in a, in a GIS uh, analysis. So we have forests, we have uh, Grasslands, we have 
crops, who have human density, who have roads. And now in this point, in this moment, this expert, we create the group. Finally, we create the group. There are 50 uh, stakeholders, 50 experts on, on connectivity and Jaguars in uh, this Google group, and they are feeling this uh, resistant value. Then we have to get an agreement to get a final number. And at the end, what we are going to have is for every pixel in the in this patch uh, landscape, a value. When the, the highest values means the highest resistance, for example, a big city, and the lowest values means uh, the lowest resistance to Jaguar movement. So this is the theory. So if you want to connect one protected area to another the origin to destination, in theory, the Jaguar is going to use the least cost uh, values. So you have the least cost pass, and then you can build the least cost corridor. This is the theory. Then you have to prove that uh, actually the animals, the, the Jaguars are using this, this corridor, but this is a different story. The thing is that once we have there, we want to share this, uh, this information with two experts that are leading connectivity, uh, as I would say, in the worldwide. One of them is Robin Edu and his team. They have developed the Protected Area Isolation Index that is going to be published in Science in the 3rd of June. So congratulations to Robin and his team. Uh, and Pacha is going to be the one of the landscapes to test this new end index to measure connectivity, how connected are the protected areas or the, or the ecological network. But also Dave Theobald from the CLC, he has developed in, uh, and his team uh, a new index called PRONET that measure connectivity at different levels, uh, different kind of movements. I find out wrong is in peer review right now, so hopefully it's going to be published soon. So uh, we are going to share this data with the scientists and using Patch as a pilot to uh, prove how well this works because the isolation in this is more based on functional connectivity and functional connectivity under pronet in structural connectivity. Also want to share this data with the decision makers as they were saying uh, before, so for that reason, we have engaged also with Steradap, which is an amazing uh, tool, at least to me, because they use the most accurate uh, land use change and climate change data to update these ecological corridors every year. So that can be used for decision makers to take decisions of, uh, of planning, the land use planning. And also, uh, but I, don't, I know that many people here, here in WWF, we are divided in nine practices. I'm for wildlife practice. But there are others that take care of food, forest, or markets. And these colleagues, they want to work outside of the protected areas, which is the important thing, one of the most important things of this initiative, that everything happens outside. And they say, okay, we have these huge landscapes. Where are we going to work? And they say, okay, we can suggest you to use the, the connectivity corridors to, for example, uh, do proof of concepts uh, about nature, positive agriculture, to engage with the companies to do a better management of their, of their land. So again, sharing the data. The, the data we are receiving, we want to then we want to transform it and share with other colleagues from. They are not scientists; they are not biologists, but they can be used also by by them. So, um, thank you so much. Just to say that sometimes sharing data can be a problem because uh, a communication problem, but also uh, if you talk with the people and you build the trust, you can get the, their confidence and they can sh share the data with you and, and work with you. So thank you so much, and we'll be happy to share any, any questions. That was um, such an interesting um, practical case study and the challenges of actually asking people and working with people to, um, oh, we're getting some claps, um, working with people to um, share data and the challenges that that, that entails. Um, one of the first questions that was posted by Valentina in the chat was, um, she was asking, how do you use your data for policy and governance decisions? Well, the idea is to provide them the corridors to say here you have a wildlife uh, ecological corridor, wildlife corridor. So you should do some actions to protect it or to, to do some policies to land use management. So we can secure the, the ecological uh, connectivity in this in this corridor, and we 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 as WWF we do that we we collaborate especially with local uh, governments to make these uh, land use plans. Sometimes they don't have the, the capacity, especially here in, in Bolivia. So we can help them with with uh, technical information, and this is one of the things that we can supply to them when they say, "Okay, I want to protect, but where? Which is which are important areas? Well, ecological corridors are." 
Um, Lisa, I just saw your um, uh, your comment in the chat and we actually saw your question highlighted. We, we have your question from your registration highlighted. I was wondering if you wanted to jump in. Do you have a mic? Uh, I think I do. Can you hear me? Yeah, we do. We, we can. Um, do you want to jump in and uh, share some of your concerns? Yeah, I mean, this is something that actually the, the idea of data sharing sensitivity um, and it's not just in South America, but um, that is where I have worked primarily. And um, I have also run into this. Um, originally, I was sharing all the data making DOIs. But with our more recent and bigger project, I have a lot of collaborators. And so, you know, opinions, uh, I have been surprised, have been profoundly negative about open access data sharing. Um, so this is a regional problem. There's, um, it's probably not gonna go away in my lifetime, uh, especially from the South America context. I was really surprised, you know, young and old, um, experienced student, uh, there's just a lot of negative, um, um, you know, resentment that first world people take data they worked for, you know, no money on, and um, they make their careers off of their backs again and again and again. And so, um, you know, I, I would just say, and this is something I brought up to um, Sarah, that there are models that, you know, someone said are resentment free, where if someone wants to use data, um, there are actually ways to contribute to projects. Uh, Rainfor with plot data, the plot data, the tropical plot data, tree plot data network um, has been uh, looking at this. And so I think that the animal movement group <laughs> maybe need to look at those sorts of um, um, issues as well. Uh, my final point that I think is important, and Sarah pointed this out, there's, it's, it's up to the publishers and scientific journals. If they um, allow a way to have a DOI that you still retain some control, that would be very helpful for someone like me who would like to make DOIs available, but with some level of control. Also, sometimes we're responsible to our funders, like Fundação Boticario requires any publication that they helped fund, um, you know, have um, proper authorship and recognition of them, which doesn't happen when it's a secondary use. So I guess that's about all I had to say, but I'm interested in other people's thoughts on all this. Um, no, you, you, if I can jump, sorry. No, but I totally agree with Lisa. No, I have the same feeling uh, as she. But in fact, in, in the past, we have to recognize that there was some kinds of views no when the scientists here in South America for especially from the United States came here they used data or used the knowledge of the local researches but I don't think that is happening anymore in my experience as I said I've been working here for 20 years I have seen a lot of collaboration between people from Europe and Latin American countries but it still remains no? it's still in the memories of the people and they have they have that that concern and also what is a big reality is that um, it takes for us. It takes a lot of time to publish, much more than you. So if if, if, yeah, if I give you my data, you're going to publish in two months, and I, it would takes me like six months or month or more to to do that. That that's also a reality we have to take into into consideration. And yes, when, when we were asking for the data, they published data. They want to want to, want to repeat it again. They published data. The idea is to at the end is to have a paper with this uh, ecological network. And of course, all the, all of them sharing the data are going to be co-authors of the of this uh, of this paper, and this is good because data that have been already used, that have been already published, can be used again. So, yeah, although we we explain them, sometimes, as I said, I think it was a comes uh, problem that make all this all this trouble. Sarah, did you yeah. want to? No, go ahead. I just... Oh, I was I I love your story, Rafael, because I think I mean it. I can imagine, uh, I guess one question is like, how, how would you approach it differently if you started over again? But I also like getting to, you know, what all the topics that, that Lisa brought up. I mean, I think what you're doing is super important because as I've seen is you see people who originally are very, very hesitant about sharing data. And then after they have a successful experience with it, then they don't see it as an enemy right? They see, they, they see how they benefited from it. They see how their data, you know, became more useful because of it. And so 
there's this very sometimes very slow like movement towards being tr you know trusting it and 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 being familiar with how how it work how you how it works for you um and so i think what you're doing is kind of some important groundwork for for making people cuz because it's totally, you know, legit to ask questions about about data sharing and, and under what circumstances. Um, but you want to not start out with a total, you know, it's it, to move from a profoundly negative view of the concept to one like, okay, I'm open to discussion here. Like that, that's a movement, I think, in in a you know a good direction. Um, yeah. So how would you like advise something like that again? Like, is there like an order that you would, um, like, would you have changed, how would you have reordered the agenda, maybe? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that we, we failed because we, we didn't give to the expert a voice at the beginning of the, of the workshop. And we, we did it, uh, we, we recognized what we have to do it, but we, we should do it at the, at the beginning. We thought, okay, we have read uh, their papers, we know what they are publishing, but we know uh, what they are doing or what they did at least, but uh, but we, we should we should listen to to them first, give them uh, more participation. And I, I saw Jeffrey; he is here. Uh, he could raise uh, his hand because he was part of this of this group. I would love to to listen his his opinion because he's uh, in in the what Abby was saying before about sharing data. This open source. Uh, Jeffrey has an impressive. Uh, paper on Jaguar movement and he shared all this data. It's one of the main sources for this information. Jeffrey, I would love if you can jump in and give us uh, your your impression on or your your thoughts about all these things because you were part he, he was part of this of this workshop. He did have his hand up. So Jeffrey, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, I just want I, I just wanted to chime in. I'm a bit reluctant to do it on these big things, but um, like Raphael said, I was part of that process. And I think, I, I want to say, I think that Raphael's characterization is a little off. Um, and I want, it's in line with what Lisa was saying was, um, myself and my were, um, other Jaguar researchers, most of them collaborators, our, our issues weren't necessarily sharing data at all. Uh, as Raphael said, I was co-author as many as the others on a large data paper where we made 117 Jaguar telemetry data sets available publicly. Um, the issue was that we have a, a, a group of collaborators, multinational transboundary collaborators working on issues of connectivity. And it, basically the question was why did, you know, all of a sudden WWF and Center for Landscape, Large Landscape Conservation shows up and wants to do exactly what we're doing and wants our data. Um, so the question was why you know, we're doing that and why do we need you? And it wasn't very clear if we were being just asked for our data and that was it, or we were being asked to collaborate. Um, and so, and it wasn't just our collaborations. There were several students working on dissertations. They need to publish. They, and so there was a lot of conflicts there. And I think that's part of the issue. Um, you know, I'm sorry. I, you know, I live in South America. I make nine. I live on nine hundred dollars a month, um, I, and do research. But you know, having people coming from the north saying, "Let's give me, give us your data. Uh, we're doing this stuff. You're doing it anyway." It's it's it does put you off. So um, the communication needs to be better in these types of things. That's uh, yeah. I wanted to mentioned. That's really, I think, the biggest issue. I don't know anybody who has any problem sharing data as long as they get recognized for it. And it's not conflicted with what they're doing. That's it. It's kind of the, the basis for any good collaboration is the initial trust and the communication and the time it takes to build that, that sort of relationship. And you, you can't speed it up, right? Sounds like what, what you, the point that you're making. Yes. Yes, I totally agree with Jeffrey. We failed in this in this communication thing. Um, well, we, we we I think we resolved it, and now I have received your email, Jeffrey, this morning. So thank you, thank you so much for for your expert knowledge. Thank you, very timely. All right, I'm. Um, there's I think there's a bigger conversation here around um, uh, supporting um, uh, data sharing and data standards. I'm going to hold the rest.
to the question. There's also a whole conversation happening about, happening about poaching um, in the chat. So we're going to hold that to the, the group discussion. Um, Raphael, thank you very much. We're going to hand over to our last speaker, who is Stu uh, from Motus.